Tonight, the high cost of food across Canada hits the Thanksgiving dinner table. Obviously looking for the best bang for the buck. So that we're not spending so much. We're to, actually going to have chicken this year. Some tips to make that traditional menu last longer. New Canadian research raises concerns about a popular off-label drug. If they want to start it for weight loss, um, it's very important that they're aware of the risks. The unprecedented breakdown in the U.S. House of Representatives. The Office of Speaker of the House is hereby declared vacant. We break down what might come next. This is The National with Ian Hennemansen. Never mind the cooking and family drama. For many Canadians, this Thanksgiving, finances are taking over as a top stressor. The traditional dinner with all the fixings is more expensive than ever. Research points to big price hikes compared to last year for everything from turkey to pumpkin. And with the cost of living already so high, that is forcing many to make changes. Some are just opting out of turkey, but the pressure is intense on organizations that help those in need. Julia Wong with some of the ways Thanksgiving dinner could look a little different. Ocean Suse is feeling the pinch of making a Thanksgiving meal for 20. So she's doing a potluck. So that we're not spending so much like ourselves, getting somebody else to help us, or like all the other family too. It's the same for Troy Ryzen, who is changing what he's serving up. We're actually going to have chicken this year. You really have to watch your, your, uh, your money because uh, I am retired. So, of course, uh, we are on a, a limited budget. Putting a traditional Thanksgiving dinner on the table this year will cost you more. Compared to prices last year, Dalhousie University researchers say squash is 63% more expensive. The guest of honor, turkey, is up 18%, pumpkins, 12%, green beans, 11% higher, and the price of butter has risen 10%. With higher prices, you have fewer choices, uh, essentially. And uh, uh, I think that people have to approach meal preparation very differently uh, for this Thanksgiving, for sure. The holiday comes as Ottawa says grocery chains are promising more discounts, price freezes and price matching to help Canadians struggling with the cost of living. That's who Meals on Wheels is trying to help too. What is on the menu for the Thanksgiving meal? A roast turkey, cranberry sauce, mashed potatoes. But the cost of providing that has gone up 30% this year alone. We've had to dip below um, into a deficit in order to provide these meals. And so um, we're hoping that we can start to see things clear up as, as we do have more donor support. The organization has had to raise prices for the first time in 20 years. And its executive chef is always looking for deals. As we put our orders in uh, twice a week, uh, we go through the website or whatever we're looking at the price, obviously looking for the best bang for the buck. So, Julia, I'm very interested to find out what tips you have on, on how we can save money this holiday. Well, Ian, there are some ways that you can save if you're willing to move away from those traditional Thanksgiving foods. Sylvain Charlebois says pork is now at pre-COVID prices and the cost of tofu is actually down 6% from last year. He's also stressing don't waste anything, saying that you can make sandwiches from leftovers and stews from bones. Part of the plan for sure, Julie Wong in Edmonton. Thank you. While everyone watches their bottom line, some are also closely watching another economic indicator, job numbers. Canada added more jobs than expected last month. Nisha Patel explains what that could mean to policymakers as they consider another interest rate hike. The headline is eye-popping. More than twice as many jobs added in September as expected, 64,000. But that's not as strong as it sounds. Much of the hiring was in education, and that may be a seasonal blip. There were more jobs in transportation and warehousing, but fewer in finance and real estate and construction. Most of those jobs were also part-time, amid booming immigration as Canada sees the fastest population growth since 1957. I think that, on one hand, creates a pressure to keep adding jobs to the economy. On the other hand, that has provided a lot of relief um, from the labor shortage. So where are you off to today? Some businesses, like this trucking company, are still desperate to hire. There's more drivers who are 
uh, getting older, retiring. There's less new drivers coming into the industry, so it becomes more and more challenging. Drivers say it's good work and they're busy. There's a chronic shortage of guys. We can work 70 hours every week. It's, it's that bad. And in a competitive job market where workers are demanding higher pay, average hourly wages are up 5% year over year. This economist says that's something the Bank of Canada is watching closely. Companies and businesses are still raising prices quite frequently. And they are doing that partly to maintain the margin while paying their workers more. South of the border, the latest U.S. report also blew past expectations. 336,000 jobs really is a testament to the, the resiliency of the labor market. It's all heaping pressure on central bankers, who've been aggressively hiking interest rates for a year and a half, hoping to lower inflation. They've been expecting job growth to cool. Still beyond this jobs report, the Bank of Canada has other data points to consider. The economy is slowing and inflation has come down. The smart money is putting the chances of another interest rate hike later this month at about 40 percent. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. A small plane crashed in Chilliwack, British Columbia this afternoon, killing three people. It went down beside a motel, the pilot among the dead. The aircraft belongs to Sky Quest Aviation. That's a flight school in nearby Langley, B.C. The Transportation Safety Board is investigating. A Canadian study is raising new questions about popular drugs like Ozempic. Millions use them for weight loss, but as Christine Burak explains, they could be linked to serious gastrointestinal problems. Ozempic is awful. While rare, the side effects can be crippling. For three days, she's had horrible pain in her stomach. Canadian researchers now say popular weight loss drugs like Ozempic can be linked to serious digestive problems. There's really no such thing as a miracle drug. If they want to start it uh, for weight loss, um, it's very important that they're aware of the risks. In the first published large population level study, researchers found compared to another medication approved for obesity management, people using diabetes drugs for weight loss are at nine times higher risk of pancreatitis, which can cause severe abdominal pain, requiring hospitalization and surgery four times higher risk of bowel obstruction and nearly four times higher risk of gastroparesis or stomach paralysis that can cause severe nausea and vomiting. Weight management doctors who've also done work for the drug companies say that makes sense. When we look at a medication that works at a much higher level and causes much more weight loss, we're going to see more side effects. Overall, the study found up to two in every 100 patients using obesity drugs developed gastrointestinal problems. The findings are observational and don't prove cause and effect, but the U.S. FDA recently announced warning labels on Ozempic will be updated, adding the drug may also increase the risk of a life-threatening intestinal blockage. With millions of people using the medications worldwide, it means real risks for large numbers of people. I don't think that for many people, the risk is actually worth it. But each individual has to make their, 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 their own choice. Novo Nordisk, the company that makes Ozempic, says the drug already warns users about gastrointestinal problems. Health Canada says it will review the Canadian study along with others to determine whether updated safety warnings are needed. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. Some Canadian staff are being moved out of India amid those diplomatic tensions between the two countries. Multiple sources telling CBC News there's a Tuesday deadline for Canada to reduce its diplomatic presence by about 40 people. If that deadline is missed, India says it might revoke diplomatic immunity for additional staff. Some members have already been moved to Malaysia and Singapore. The Nobel Peace Prize has been awarded to Iran's Nargis Mohammadi, but the champion of women's rights and democracy in that country isn't likely to accept the award in person. As Alison Northcott shows, she and others inspired by her are behind bars. I hope one day to be able to tell you that execution have stopped in Iran. Nargis Mohammadi has been pushing for women's rights in Iran for decades. With tremendous personal cost. Altogether, the regime has arrested her 13 times, convicted her five times, and sentenced her to a total of 31 years in prison. 
Even in Iran's Evin prison, where she's serving 12 years for charges including spreading propaganda against the state, she has continued to speak out, adding her voice to widespread protests triggered by 22-year-old Masa Amini, who died last year after she was arrested by Iran's morality police for allegedly not wearing her hijab properly. Mohammadi is still seen as a tireless advocate. She started to echo the voice of those who were unknown and voiceless. She was fighting against execution. So you see, she is wounded, but unbreakable, unbowed. And this is what the Iranian women are. Mohammadi hasn't seen her husband or her two children in years. Her husband watched the prize announced on TV in exile in France. He says it will open a door for Nargis's motivation in fighting for human rights. It will make her fearless. There was again another fine. This human rights activist in Montreal says Mohammadi is just one of many Iranian women in prison for speaking out. And it comes just days after activists allege a teen girl fell into a coma after a confrontation with morality police, which Iranian authorities deny. In the middle of darkness and continuation of human violation in Iran, it was a ray of hope in my heart. Iran's foreign ministry condemned Mohammadi's prize, calling it biased and politicized. Human rights activists call it bittersweet. Their struggle is being recognized, even as they wage it against terrible odds. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. That young Iranian woman fighting for her life in hospital has reminded so many of the death of Masa Amini. In both cases, there is not real transparency and real truth and awareness of what's happened. Later in the show, we break down the video and what we know about Armita Garavand. A terrible bus crash in southern Mexico has killed 18 migrants. At least 27 others of the estimated 55 passengers were injured. They were mainly from Venezuela and Haiti, and they were headed towards the U.S. border. The cause of the crash still being investigated. Alberta Parks has issued two separate notices about bears this long weekend, and it comes after that fatal grizzly attack in Banff National Park last week and another attack just south of the Alberta-Montana border. Renee Filipponi explains why this time of year brings heightened risks and why that's especially the case in parts of Canada right now. Enjoying the changing colors of the fall comes with a risk here, bears. You know, we never want to encounter them, but if you do, we just... You know, you want to just, um, no, no precautionary, you know, back away. Um, you're in their space, just remembering that. Um, and just st stand your ground, I think, is a safe bet with both the, the black and the grizzly. Alberta Parks has issued two notices after encounters in Kananaskis country, west of Calgary. This is video shot in West Bragg Park. A grizzly is on the chase, looking for its next meal. It's a critical time of year for bears, called hyperphagia, where they fatten up in preparation for hibernation. If a bear is having trouble building up fat reserves, it absolutely will change their behavior, just like it would for any of us, right? There's that will to live. Last week, a grizzly killed a couple near Banff. The bear was skinny for this time of year. In B.C., there has been a major spike in black bear sightings as they get close to communities scavenging for food. The big ones are garbage, organic waste, bird feeders, fruit trees on our properties. Right now, pumpkins, so if you have a pumpkin, please store it inside. And the record fire season is making it worse in some parts of the province. The forests are burning and, um, you know, incredible amounts of forest um, being destroyed. So I think that would be displacing and putting pressure on bears um, on their food uh, sources as well as their uh, denning sites. These Albertans are intent on enjoying the wilderness. We uh, um, have bear spray that we uh, they travel with, try and make noise, um, bike in groups instead of on your own. Taking precautions so they can share the great outdoors with the bears. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Drake has a new album, a big concert, a city packed with fans, but Philip Lee Shannock shows why they're suddenly talking about his health, not his music. The number's going up, someone pull up the line graph. On the day he released his latest album, the day he set to play the first of two shows in his hometown of Toronto, Drake had something much more personal to talk about, announcing his plan to take a long break. 
I'm gonna lock the door in the studio for a little bit. I don't even know what a little bit is. Uh, maybe, maybe a year or something, or maybe a little longer. Drake explained why on a Sirius XM radio show. I need to focus on my health first and foremost. I want people to be healthy in life, and I've been having the craziest problems for years with my stomach. Fans in Toronto say Champagne Poppy deserves it. He's been leading the game for a very long time, so I feel like when a break is needed, he needs to take it. He needs a break so he can like get his goodness back in the music, you know, quality over quantity. This entertainment journalist says the timing isn't coincidental. The two shows he'll be playing in Toronto tonight and tomorrow are going to be that much more of a must-get ticket. And then there's that much more hype around his new album for the dogs because people are going to be like, we might not get new Drake music for quite some time. We're hearing from more and more artists who say that they're struggling and they need to hit pause for their physical or mental well-being and to perform in the future. Justin Bieber chose his health over career recently, canceling his U.S. dates due to exhaustion. There's been more emphasis on mental health since the pandemic in particular, um, and that is a great thing, but it's not like it doesn't come with a cost. You used to call me on my cell phone. But Drake can probably afford to take a break. He's been one of the world's most successful hip-hop artists for more than a decade. Philip Shadok, CBC News, Toronto. A Toronto couple had their lives upended after a city contractor accidentally drilled a massive hole into their basement. It's disappointing, it's angering, it's frustrating, and it's almost, almost unbelievable. The video that shows how the incident unfolded, next. Plus, a QAnon group takes a small Saskatchewan community by storm. You never know who's actually going to take these violent threats seriously. The push by local residents to get the group out. And later, pen pals for more than four decades. <laughs> the emotional moment they finally met. We're back in two. Dramatic video has emerged of this FedEx plane skipping across the tarmac of a Tennessee airport. The crew reported the landing gear wasn't working as they were on final approach. No one was seriously injured, and the U.S. transportation officials are investigating. It was supposed to be the repair of a public sidewalk. Well, the pictures you're about to see show how well that went and why a Toronto couple has a big problem with the city. Farah Morali takes it from here. So the city showed up to do work on the sidewalk, didn't tell us anything about it in spite of us trying to reach out to them to find out more. And now, this is what I have to deal with. All that debris from this large hole, now in the ceiling of David Stone's basement. The aftermath of the sidewalk repair gone terribly wrong. Stone runs a music school on the ground floor of the building and lives upstairs with his family. It's disappointing, it's angering, it's frustrating, and it's almost, almost unbelievable. The whole series of events caught on the couple's security camera. On Monday, a truck is seen arriving to start fixing the sidewalk out front of their building. It later starts jackhammering, getting closer and closer to the doorstep of the building, before the worker realizes he's dug into a basement. He later rings the doorbell to alert David's wife, Erin. Oh well, we've seen a lot of claims like this over the last, say, 10 to 15 years. This lawyer says he's seeing more and more cases of city contractors causing damage to private property. But ultimately, the city is on the hook for these repairs, not the homeowners. And the damage they cause in negligence through, through mistakes um, is something that they're liable for. After CBC contacted the city, it did dispatch its own engineer. But no one would speak to us for an interview, saying only in a statement, these kinds of unexpected situations can be challenging, which is why the city is working with the property owner to address this unfortunate and unusual situation. I feel very abandoned by the city. Meanwhile, the city has corded off the entrance to the building. Times are hard enough for everybody as it is, especially for a small independent business. Stone has contacted his own insurance company, 
He says a broker told him the city's insurance needs to step in, but to touch base next week. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. Tensions are running high in a small Saskatchewan community where members of a fringe conspiracy group have settled in. What does happen if something does happen to a kid? The growing threats police are now investigating. Plus, chaos in Congress. Chaos is Speaker McCarthy. Chaos is somebody who we cannot trust. The removal of the House Speaker puts the U.S. in uncharted territory. So now what? And the alleged assault of another young woman in Iran is sparking outcry. It's relived trauma for the Iranian people. Will it reignite an uprising against the regime? The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. My hope for her here is that she just has fun. She can do an amazing floor routine. Simone Biles can definitely do amazing. With this routine, the American won the sixth all-round title of her career at the World Championships. She is now the most decorated gymnast in the sport's history. A village in Saskatchewan is turning to the RCMP for help after a group of extremist followers of a self-proclaimed Queen of Canada occupied a local building. Sam Sampson went there to find a community on edge, especially after the group threatened to publicly execute those who oppose it. In the village of Richmond, Saskatchewan, play has been replaced by patrol, an old school building now occupied by a group of conspiracy theorists. While that group's leader works inside, the 118 people who live here worry outside. It got everybody on their toes, and it's been sort of like a... People are just staying in their houses more. And I did talk to a younger kid, whatever, the other day, and I said, what do you think of these people here? And he said, oh, man, that's scary. I'll never go there. The woman inside the school is Romana Digilo. She says she's the Queen of Canada, and her followers believe it. This small group closest to her and the tens of thousands online who get her messages, or as she calls them, decrees. They vary from not paying taxes to encouraging violence against those who give out COVID vaccines. You go home, After you being driven out of Chamsack, Saskatchewan last month, residents say Digilo's convoy arrived in Richmond the following day, setting up in the school after the local who owns it sent out an invite. Hi Rick, we're just hoping to speak with someone who's staying He and other members of the group didn't respond to our requests for interviews. <laughs> They also ignored Richmond's protest. The people we spoke with who live here in Richmond say they don't want to share their opinions publicly because they're afraid of facing individual threats. Now some say this is no big deal because they're on private land, so leave them be, while others say their presence is intimidating and it's causing anxiety. On Sunday, Digilo's group sent out threatening letters to locals and authorities, suggesting whoever gets in the group's way or doesn't abide by its beliefs will face public execution. The community asked the province for help, but it deferred to the RCMP. We're taking these issues with the, the most seriousness, uh, seriousness and, and, and making sure that, uh, that we're able to maintain some, some, some freedom of association, some freedom of speech. What does happen if something does happen to a kid? And then everybody says, oh, maybe we should have did something. And that's too late then. The mayor says the school doesn't have heat. Online, Digilo's followers say they're stocking up on socks and mitts, preparing for a prairie winter. Sam Sampson, CBC News, Richmond, Saskatchewan. Now let's break down the news shaping our world. A young woman clings to life after another alleged assault by Iran's morality police. But first. A historic vote puts Washington in chaos again. Declared vacant. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, third in line to the U.S. presidency, ousted by a small band of hardliners from his own party. Chaos is Speaker McCarthy. The House now headless. I will not run for speaker again. As Americans wonder, what comes next? Well, here to break all of this down for us is CBC Washington correspondent Paul Hunter and New York Times congressional reporter Karim Demurgian. Welcome to both of you. Hey, Ann. It's uh, Paul, let me start with you. Never in American history has the U.S. House Speaker been voted out of their job. So put this in perspective for us. How, how big is it? Look, 
The Speaker is second in line to the presidency, a hugely powerful position. And more than anyone else on Capitol Hill, the Speaker is tasked with getting stuff done. And just like that, gone. You know, the knives had been out for McCarthy for some time, but he had until this week been adept at avoiding them until he couldn't, leaving the House of Representatives now standing in chaos. It's a real problem on Capitol Hill, but it's a serious problem for Republicans themselves. We're a year away from the next election, and the image they're putting forward to the U.S., uh, and by the way, to the world, is that they can't even govern themselves. Karim, help our Canadian audience understand what happens now. A few days ago, we were talking about a potential U.S. government shutdown. Now, Congress doesn't have a speaker. Well, what does it mean when it comes to day-to-day -to -day governing of the United States of America? It means the House is pretty much frozen until they can figure out who's going to succeed McCarthy in the Speaker's spot. There is an interim Speaker, but he doesn't really have the full powers of the Speakership right now. So anything legislative, anything that actually could move across the House floor is on hold until that happens. And that's an especially acute problem right now because, as you just pointed out, the U.S. government, Congress, just narrowly avoided a government shutdown at the end of last month, which was the end of the fiscal year. And they did so by passing a something that's called a continuing resolution, which keeps the government open, in this case, for another 45 days. Well, we're already through about a week of that 45 days. And if the House stays frozen for several more weeks trying to figure this out, there's supposed to be a, an election that happens on Wednesday, but there's really mixed minds on Capitol Hill as to whether anything will be resolved by then. As long as the House is frozen, you can't negotiate and pass appropriations bills to keep the government open past that next deadline. And there's a lot of really contentious issues that need to be worked on that nobody can really work on in a constructive way until they resolve who's actually going to be in charge with the gavel in the House. And Karum, you know, here again from this Canadian perspective, there seems to be brinksmanship when it comes to these spending bills and at the last moment something works out. When you take sort of the impasse and, and now the absence of a speaker and put them together, is there kind of real concern that the next time the spending authority runs out, uh, there won't be a, a, a last-minute solution? There is real concern. I mean, it's... The United States has not had a government shutdown for a couple of years, but it has had several government shutdowns happen before. And so it's always a concern as this brinksmanship gets more and more arched that this might be not the time that it, somebody doesn't want to make a last minute deal. And, you know, this last time, Kevin McCarthy really surprised everybody by abandoning what had been his negotiating position, which was catering to the far right, saying we're going to try to do this in a straight way and basically making a decision at the 11th hour where everything hustled together in just a couple of hours to keep the government from shuttering over the last weekend. Um, but remember, they didn't resolve a whole bunch of the contentious issues. There are a lot, number of people in the Republican Party that are angry that that package to keep the government open did not include stringent border security measures. There's a number of people who are upset that it didn't include continued um, funds to help it fuel weapons towards the Ukraine war. These are all very contentious issues that have yet to be resolved. There are no easier to resolve the next time, but with less time to negotiate. The, the whole point of buying this month and a half of time was that everybody could have calmer, less frenzied conversations. But the more you eat away at that clock, because the House can't actually be fully functioning, the more frenzied the next juncture of trying to pass a budget is going to be. Paul, let's talk about those eight Republicans who sided with the Democrats against other Republicans, managed to oust the Speaker, Kevin McCarthy. Um, how much power do they have over their own party? Well, they certainly have the power to knock out the Speaker of the House. We know that much. Um, best known of the eight, uh, as some would put it, the ringleader is Representative Matt Gates from Florida, longtime Donald Trump supporter. It's he who brought the motion to vacate. It was he who was chief among those who made McCarthy agree to change the rules in the first place in order for McCarthy to win the speakership back in January. That is, change the rules to allow just one member to do as Gates did and stand up with that motion to vacate. Gates says it was done in the name of smarter government, but as McCarthy himself has noted, there's no small degree of personal antipathy between the two. Others have labeled Gates little more than a performance artist, but nonetheless one who's made this happen. I'm not going to name all the rest, but suffice to say they are generally among the most conservative conservatives from supporting the Joe Biden impeachment inquiry, regardless of the absence of hard evidence, to those who still deny the 2020 election results. Generally speaking, 
they adhere to Trump's America First doctrine and, for example, have little time for coming to the aid of Ukraine. The power you ask about comes from that one rule that McCarthy agreed to, that one member can pull the trigger, a rule which, as we speak, remains in place for whoever the next speaker is, meaning the same eight, or for that matter, anybody else, can pull the same trigger at any time in an ununified party that's at war with itself. The whole thing, Ian, is a mess. And so, Karum, given all of this, including how simple it is to enter that motion and, as we've seen, remove the speaker, does anybody want this job? Is there anybody out there who will get this job? There are at least two people who have officially declared that they want the job. One is Steve Scalise. He's from Louisiana. He has been the number two Republican in the House, serving right below McCarthy. So he would kind of be next in line in terms of seniority succession, if that's how everybody agrees that it can work. The other uh, main figure that has emerged is Jim Jordan. Jim Jordan is basically the leader of much of the right. He is not somebody who opposed McCarthy. He and McCarthy had bad blood about a decade ago. They've since mended ways. Um, but Jordan is somebody who's one of the founders of the House Freedom Caucus, which is this group of far-right Republicans that are hardliners. He is somebody that they all look up to as kind of one of their, their, their founding figures. And he has the ear and the loyalty of the right wing. He's also very close to former President Trump, who endorsed him in this speaker's race um, last night. And so you've got uh, those two. There may be others that have not formally entered, but whose names have been bandied about. Now, they're both conservative. Um, they're both pretty darn conservative. They differ on issues like whether it makes sense to keep the Ukraine war funded. Scalise is on the side that says yes. Jordan is on the side that says heck no. Um, but it's going to be, neither of them has a clear majority right now. And by that, I mean, neither of them has the 218 votes that you would need to be mm -hmm. able to just lock this down on one vote of the House and, and grab that speakership. So they are going head to head grasping for every vote that they can in the GOP. And as Paul pointed out, that's not an easy task when you can have such a small number of Republicans make demands, hold a guillotine over your head, demand certain fealty on certain policy measures, or simply just be standing there with their arms folded in the wings, saying, we're going to make this really difficult for you all the way through. And nobody's locked down the full gamut of the GOP at this point, from those most conservative figures to the people who are more close to the center of the aisle. It took 15 rounds, of course, for Kevin McCarthy to win the vote, and now he's gone. We'll see what happens next. But I understand it better after both of you have helped us break it down. Thank you. You're welcome, Ian. Thank you. Allegations of a brutal assault on an Iranian woman are once again sparking outrage. Another family has uh, been told the most uh, awful news possible. What will it mean for a popular uprising against the regime? That is next. There are renewed calls for change in Iran as an imprisoned women's rights activist receives global recognition. Nobel Peace Prize for 2023 to Nargis Mohammadi. And outrage grows over another alleged assault on a young woman by Iran's morality police. All of it one year after Masa Amini's death triggered angry protests across Iran and the world. Iran has denied any role in this latest incident, but human rights groups don't buy it. Kieran Ounshorn breaks down how the two cases are similar and what they say about the regime. An Iranian teenager is fighting for her life in hospital in a case that seems all too familiar. There is outrage in Iran after a 16-year-old girl was injured in an incident, and some are blaming the country's morality police again. So we should say that the exact events that led to Amita Garavan being put into a coma are not entirely clear yet. Reuters released footage that shows that she entered the Tehran metro not wearing a hijab, but only seconds after getting onto a subway car, she was carried off unconscious. For some, this has been enough to ignite suspicions and accusations that the Iranian regime is responsible and enough to draw comparisons to the case of Masa Amini. She was the teenager who allegedly died at the hands of the regime last year and her death sparked a nationwide movement that shook the Islamic Republic. 
Her death has become a flashpoint. Iran's long simmering tensions now pouring out into the streets. One of the fiercest displays of opposition to the country's hardline leadership ever. Many now fear that Armida Garavan will face the same fate as Amini. So let's break down what we know, what we don't know, and what we may never know. There's CCTV footage with no sound that was shared by the Iranian state news agency. Now, the authenticity of this footage has not been independently verified by CBC News, and our account of what the video purportedly shows is based on reporting from Reuters. But what I want to show you is 25 seconds, and the red circles in the video, that's where Garavand is in the frame. And that red circles, those were on the footage when we got it from Reuters. So I just want you to watch this. So you start off here and you see these three girls getting onto the train. And almost immediately after they get on, one of them steps back and she crouches down. And you know, you see this guy, he's walking up, he's watching what's happening. Clearly something is going on on board. He steps out to take a look and then steps on. Now you have this period of time where this woman is crouching down on the ground. She's pulling at something. She grabs this bag and puts it behind her. And then, and this is the important part, you see a group of women dragging this unconscious body off of the train and onto the platform. And you can see how her leg isn't moving there. What we understand is that eyewitnesses are claiming that Armita wasn't wearing a headscarf and that the um, these four individuals were essentially roughhousing her. They pushed her, her head then hit a metal bar and she fainted. The Iranian government has given their own version of what could have happened. They claim that Garavan fainted because of a drop in blood sugar levels after skipping breakfast. But human rights groups have called on the Iranian government to publish the footage from inside the cabin, but they haven't done that yet. And so far they've denied all claims of wrongdoing. Most of what we know is coming from this Iranian Kurdish uh, human rights organization called Hengua. Um, they have said that, uh, you know, that this young woman boarded the train, that she had a confrontation with Iran's morality police, that she was um, injured in that confrontation, and that she is now in a coma in the hospital. Now, of course, the Iranian government has uh, refuted that. Garavan, now in a coma, has been in a military hospital all week. Human rights groups and activists say that the Iranian security agents have surrounded the hospital and locked down the ward that she's in. And this is where we start to see more similarities with what happened last year with Masa Amini. Masa Amini's case is, is, is very similar. Also a young woman um, didn't do anything but, but be alive, be present in the world. And uh, she was brutally beaten, um, went into a coma and uh, died shortly after. It's relived trauma for the Iranian people. Um, another family has uh, been told the most uh, awful news possible, that their daughter, only 16 years old, a child, has been um, beaten so badly that she's now in a coma. According to the human rights group Henga, Garavan's mother has been arrested, although we don't know why, and we don't have any other details. The problem is that the Islamic Republic has a long history of putting extreme pressure on family members in sensitive situations to get them to not reveal what has really happened and to not raise questions. Other rights groups and activists have said that the regime has threatened to arrest any of Garavan's family members or classmates who speak to the media. The teachers at the school where Armita goes have been intimidated into silence because um, over the last year since Masa Amini was brutally killed in much the same way, um, teachers have uh, supported their students, have very often supported their protests. And this has evoked memories of the Islamic regime allegedly attempting to control the narrative after Masa Amini died. Iranian authorities reportedly have placed Masa Amini's family under house arrest. Amini's family was reportedly threatened by Iranian agents after her death, and they claimed to receive death threats and were warned about getting involved in demonstrations. A journalist who was trying to interview Armita's mother about what happened was detained by the Islamic Republic of Iran authorities. According to colleagues of the Iranian newspaper journalist Marian Latfi, she was arrested after visiting the hospital. Now details are limited here, but the newspaper says that she was released later that night. 
In the case of Masa Amini, the two journalists who broke that story were arrested and charged with conspiracy and rebellion against the national security and anti-state propaganda. They were imprisoned for more than eight months before a closed-door trial began in May, and that's where they remain today. In both cases, there is not real transparency and real truth and awareness of what's happened because there's such heavy censorship and denial of access to information. The group says Armita Garawan was attacked in a Tehran subway for violating the Islamic Republic's hijab rules. What's probably the most glaring similarity that people are noting between Garavan and Amini and their stories is the involvement of the morality police. And the morality police um, is now really back out in maybe fuller force than ever before, really. Uh, and this is why we see this kind of violence. 22-year-old Mahsa Amini, arrested by the morality police in Tehran for wearing her hijab loosely. Multiple sources said she was beaten in a police truck while in custody. The state released CCTV footage claiming no violence occurred and she collapsed from a heart attack. The news sparked fury. The morality police denied any involvement in this case too. Experts say that even after the protests following Amini's death, the regime has actually doubled down on the mandatory hijab laws. But what is happening is that there is still resistance. I think the most low-key way is for young girls and women to not be wearing the compulsory hijab, which is in fact what it appears Armita was doing and resisting that gender discriminatory framework. The Iranian people are extremely angry. So I am very sure that the Iranian people are not going to relent. They're going to persist. In fact, over the last year, the Iranian government has passed even more restrictive laws on head coverings for women. Masa Amini's death sparked a national movement condemning mandatory hijab laws and the treatment of women in Iran. Whether this week's events will reignite those protests, well, that is yet to be seen. And that reporting from our colleague Kieran Ounshorn at CBC News Explore, where you can follow this and other stories 24 hours a day online and through CBC Gem. Coming up, an emotional meeting 42 years in the making. The, the depth of the emotion was just, you know, it was overwhelming. How these pen pals found each other at last. It's next in our moment. <laughs> Since becoming pen pals in 1981, Joy Lovies from Newfoundland and Osako Suzuki from Japan have nurtured a friendship spanning half the world and more than four decades. They've always wanted to meet in person, but last month, 42 years after the first letter, it finally happened. And tonight, it's our moment. <laughs> Back in 1981, the initial contact was made from her. She wrote the first letter and then I replied and my parents, they kept saying, you know, at some point as an adult, you'll get to meet her. So uh, yeah, we had been trying for a long time. So then a year ago, my daughter and her fiance decided that they would get married in Hawaii. I reached out to Chaco again and said, you know, just want to put it out there. If there's any possibility we could meet. I was gearing up for a disappointment and then her her next paragraph said, we have booked our flights. I said, well, I'm crying here, but they're tears of joy. This is something that we had dreamed about for 42 years. So I was going across the park and uh, caught sight of her. And, and uh, of course we kind of ran to each other. You could feel the love, all the family were there and there wasn't a dry eye, I don't think. <laughs> the feelings that, uh, that went with that meeting were just, yeah, yeah unreal. Yeah. I forgot about pen pals. So many people back then, 40 years ago or so, had them, but to sustain it that long, and Hawaii seems like the perfect meeting place for one person from Japan, the other from Newfoundland and Labrador, but Suzuki is planning to make the long trek to Newfoundland after she retires. That is The National for October 6th, and tonight we bid farewell to a longtime colleague, executive producer Dan Getz, who's moving on to the academic world. So to Dan and all of you, have a great weekend.